Hello, fellow whiskey, bourbon, and scotch enthusiasts. If you find yourself watching this video, you might consider yourself a scotch enthusiast in particular. And if you find yourself a scotch enthusiast, it's likely that you have a fairly polarized opinion about scotch blends. Either you have had the upper end blends and you know the, um, the potential they have for greatness, or you only know scotch blends by the bottom shelf, rock gut pours like Johnny Walker Red or whatever bad experience you've had. So here we are in part two of Brett Mullins and I's blended scotch series, where we're trying to figure out where does the quality lie within the blended scotch industry. Uh, and we're doing a series of three blind tastes to try and find out. So last week, Brett and I looked at exclusively budget blends, bottom shelf blends, if you will, blends that you can find pretty widespread for under $40. Uh, and we both discovered that we really liked Compass Box Great King Street Artist Blend. We also really liked Monkey Shoulder. Uh, and we found surprising value uh, for Brett in Valentine's Finest and for myself in John Barr. This week, we're looking exclusively at peated blends. Uh, we're not staying within a price range here, but actually wanting to look at peated blends within a whole spectrum of price ranges. And so we have uh, blends that can be found for as little as $20 or $25, going all the way up to blends that cost well over $100. So I'll tell you what we've got lined up, and then we'll start tasting. So within these five, which are random, I have no idea what's in what, we have Compass Box's Peat Monster. We have Compass Box's Flaming Heart. This is the 15th anniversary edition. We have Black Grouse. We have Big Peat. This one is a cask strength Christmas edition. Thank you, by the way, Paul Clark, for providing Brett and I with this sample. And then we have the one everybody knows, Johnny Walker Black. So let's get right into it. Like the last video, I don't want this to go, you know, much over 15 minutes. Uh, and so I'm going to give fairly concise, short tasting notes, and then we'll rank them all at the end. So starting with whiskey number one. It's a pretty smoky peat. All of these are going to be peat, so I'm not just going to say peat, but trying to describe the intricacies of the peat. It's fairly smoky. It smells a lot like uh, like burning coals. Campfire would be the most accurate way to describe this. Just a regular old campfire with friends is what this blend smells like. It's not intense enough that you can't find a nice amount of vanilla underneath it as well. It's a smooth blend. It's not off-putting on the nose. Not overly intense, but definitely enjoyable. The palette starts off with that malty vanilla note but then it really quickly gets overpowered by that smoky, smoldering peatiness. Uh, it again comes on strong with burning logs, campfire, and it has a slight uh, teriyaki smoke note to it. Uh, a slight, almost smoked fish note, teriyaki smoked fish, really slightly salty, verging on medicinal. But overall, this is an excellent peated dram. I could sip this all day long. Honestly, this is great stuff. Nothing off-putting. Not really any burn. Uh, it's clear. It's focused. This is great stuff.
whenever you're tasting multiple whiskeys, especially if they're going to have um, a tongue coating of a flavor as peat generally is, I think it's important to always try and cleanse your palate with whatever you have available in between. In this case, salty Tostitos chips, a little bit of water. You just don't want to still have a whole bunch of the taste of the previous whiskey on your tongue when you taste the second whiskey or you're not going to get clear results. Whiskey number two. This one is actually, I, I might mistake this for an unpeated whiskey. This comes across as more malty than peaty. It's got a little bit of uh, a confectioner sugar, a little bit of a uh, slightly industrial glue or rubber cement like note to it. I'm struggling to find peat, <clears throat> honestly, to find peat in this at all on the nose. It's even got a little bit of fruits in it, uh, a little bit of a, a strawberry note, a slight raspberry note, pretty much anything but peat in the nose of this one. Same thing on the palate. I actually get, if anything, kind of like a, a vanilla cake mix, cake batter, slightly uh, a slight bit of grassiness in it, a slight bit of oakiness, fairly sweet, tiny bit bitter, nothing resembling peat or smoke or brine or anything that you would expect at all in this guy. Kind of baffling. Um, it's not bad. Uh, it's bland. Like I said, there's there's a slightly sweet vanilla cake batter type note to it, and not much besides it. But no peat. Interesting. We'll move on to number three. All right, Peter blend number three. Get a little more water. This one's really interesting. Also not super peaty, just like number two, but there's a lot more going on here than there was in number two. This one actually has a fair amount of like sherry type fruit notes in it. I'm finding blackberries, raspberries, almost a hint of slightly acidic, uh, like an apple cider type note to it. It's sweet, it's slightly jammy. And there's maybe a little hint of baking spice. Something like nutmeg. Honestly, again, though, I, I would not guess, if I didn't know that all these were allegedly peated, I would not guess that this was peated. The palette here, I get buttercream frosting, I get a little bit of wood spice, 
I get a little bit of like an overly ripe, maybe a pear note, a white fruit. Um, it's so sweet that you almost mistake it for a fruit. And then on the finish, you finally get a little sign that there's some peat in here. The finish gets slightly smoky, uh, a little bit, maybe you could call it acrid. Overall, actually, this is a really interesting dream to me. Definitely not bad stuff. I could sip this guy. All right, dream number four. This one's got a real nice mix of sweet and peat on the nose. It's really heavy with confectioner's sugar uh, a really sweet barley malt. Almost has a candy corn feel to it. But then it's also got a really clean, really dry smoke to it. What I mean by clean and dry is you don't get, um, you know, it's unflavored smoke. You don't get like a wood smoke or like a briny medicinal Lafroig type smoke. You know, I like to call it burning seaweed or burning driftwood. You don't get any of that. It's just a really clean, undistinguishable smoke that sits along with the sweet on the nose here. And then on the palate, this guy totally reverses, reverses course. Big, burly, strong, sock you in the tongue palate on this guy. Uh, waves and waves of peat on the palate here. I don't think I can stress that enough. Just a peat flavor bomb on the palate. Wow. Totally misleading from the nose to the palate. The palate is all, um, you know, kind of a rank, salty, um, you know, briny, just full on peatiness, not dry, uh, not clean smoke. This one is smoke laden with brine, no sweetness on the palate. It's just heat and peat. Wow. It's a great dram. It is an intense dram. Alrighty, on to number five. This one has a lot more of a, a perfume-like nose to it. It's almost got, uh, could call it lavender or wildflower here. Also has a real sweet um, vanilla frosting like note to it. Kind of intermingled with a nice, um, slightly woody, dry peatiness. This might have um, the most well rounded peaty nose of any of them. Uh, that lavender note here is really interesting. And the palette here kind of follows suit. 
um, really smooth, um, is it almost subtle palette. There's lavender, maybe honeysuckle, definitely vanilla. On the finish, it gets peaty, a little bit smoky. Um, you know, it's more of a, like I said, a, a wood centered peat. If you remember the campfire peat from dram number one, that's kind of what this is uh, a kind of woody smoke. Uh, wow. Overall, this is, this is interesting just in the complexities and the subtleties that it holds that I don't think any of the others can match. Great dram here as well. All right. I'll do some ranking and then I'll find out what's what. I'm going to taste number one again once more. Okay. I'm going to say pour number one is first place. I'm going to say pour number four is second place. Barely edging out pour number five. Pour number three, fourth place. Pour number two, fifth place. All right, let's find out what these are. We'll start out with last place here. Last place we have, oh, I don't know if you can read that, black grouse. Black grouse. It's fifth place. Let's put this in front of me for you. Fourth place, we have uh, Johnny Walker Black. So Johnny Walker Black actually did not come in last. Third place, we have. Peat Monster. Peat Monster. Oops, I don't want that to take up the whole screen. Comes in third. Second place. It's the Big Peat. Which means our winner, don't even need to pull the tag off, is Compass Box's Flaming Heart. So overall, one thing we really wanted to discover here was with the peated blends was the price um, linearly correlated with uh, how much we liked it. And in this case, I think this might be dead on. Uh, I think Black Grouse was the lowest price. Uh, I know Flaming Heart was the highest priced. I think the rest of these might fall in line along their price scale as well. Um, Brett. Really excited to see what you have here. Uh, you told me, you gave me a little hint that your results might surprise me, so I can't wait to find out. Uh, the rest of you guys, I hope you found this helpful. Uh, just a reminder, this is um, not only part two, but each part of this series is two videos. My video as well as Brett Mullins. Uh, so check his out as well. Uh, thank you for watching. Cheers to the BSE. I'll catch back up with you soon.